Good evening, everybody. This is Carol again from the First Presbyterian Church here in Ulysses. And I am here with Freddie. And we are finishing off the line, the witch and the wardrobe. See what do it. And I have enjoyed this, reading this to you, and I hope you enjoy this. All right, so we are now on chapter seven, Hunting of the White Staff. The battle was all over a few minutes after their arrival. Most of the enemy had been killed in the first charge of Aslan and his companions. And when those who were still living saw that the witch was dead, they either gave themselves up or took to flight. The next thing that Lucy knew was that Peter and Aslan were shaking hands. It was strange for her to see Peter looking as he did. His face was so pale and stern and he seemed, he seemed so much older. It was all Edmund's doing, Aslan, Peter said. We'd been, would have been beaten if it hadn't been for him. The witch was turning our troops into stone, right and left, but nothing would stop him. He fought his way through the three orgs and where she was just turning one of your leopards into st a statue. And when he reached her, he had the sense of bringing his sword, smashing down on her wand, instead of trying to go to her directly, and simply getting made a statue himself for his play. That was the mistake all the rest of them had been making. Once her wand was broken, we began to have a chance. If we hadn't lost so many already, he was terribly wounded. We must go and see to him. They found Edmund in charge of Mrs. Beaver, a little way back from the fighting line. He was covered with blood. His mouth was open and his face a nasty green color. Quick, Lucy, said Aslan, and then almost for the first time, Lucy remembered the precious cordial that she had been given her from as a Christmas present. Her hands trembled so much that she could hardly undo the stopper. But she managed it, and at the end poured a few drops into her brother's mouth. There are other people wounded, said Asin, while she was still looking eagerly into Edmund's pale face and wondering if the cordial had, would make any results. Yes, I know, said Lucy. Wait a minute. Daughter of Eve, said Aslan in a grave voice. Others also are at the point of death. Must more people die for Edmund? I'm, I'm sorry, Aslan, said Lucy, getting up and going with him. And for the next half an hour, they were busy. At her attend, she attended the wounded while he restored those who had been turned into stone. When at last she was free to come back to Edmund, she found him standing on his feet. And the only, and not only had he healed all his wounds, but was looking better than she had ever seen him before. Oh, for ages. In fact, ever since his first term at that horrible school, 
which was where he had begun to go wrong. He had become his real old self again and could look into his face and there was a field of the battle as them made him a knight. Does he know, whispered Lucy to Susan, what Aslam did for him? Does he know what the arrangements were that the witch really was? Hush. No, of course not, said Susan. Oughtn't he be told, said Lucy? Oh, surely not, said Susan. It would be too awful for him. Think how he'd feel if you were to tell him. All the same, I think he should know, said Lucy. But at that moment, they were interrupted. That night, they slept where they were. How Asim provided food for them, all I do not know how, but somehow of, or other, they found themselves all sitting down on the grass to a fine high tea at about eight o'clock. Next day, they began marching eastward down the side of the great river. And the next day after that, at about tea time, they actually reached the mouth of the river, the castle of Claire Paviel. On its little hill, towered up above them. Before them were the sands with rocks and little pools of salt water and seaweed and the smell of the sea and the long miles of bluish green waves breaking forever and ever over the beach. And oh, the cry of the seagulls. Have you heard it? Can you remember? That evening, after tea, the four children all managed to get down to the beach again. And they got their shoes off and their stockings off. Oh, and they fell into the sand between their, they felt the sand between their toes. But next day was more solemn. For then, in the great hall of Cla Paviel, that wonderful hall with the ivory roof and the west door all hung with peacock feathers and the eastern door, which opened right into the sea in the presence of all their friends and to the sound of trumpets, Aslam solemnly crowned them and led them into the four thrones amidst deafening shouts of, long live King Peter, long live Queen Susan, Long live King Edmund, long live Queen Lucy. Ah, once a king or a queen of Narnia, always a king or queen. Bear it well, son of Adam, bear it well, daughters of Eve, said Aslam. And though the eastern door, which was wide open, through the eastern door, which was wide open, the voices of the mermen and the mermaids swimming close to the castle steps, singing in honor of their new king and queen. So the children sat in their thrones and spectrums were put in their hands and they gave rewards and honors to all their friends, to Thomas the fawn to the beavers, to the giant, to the leopards, all the good dwarfs, and to the lion. At that night, there was a great feast in Claire Paviel. They revealed the dancing, the gold flash and wine flowed, and a swerving of music inside, but stranger, sweeter, 
excuse me, I'm sorry. Piercing came through the music and the sea of people. But amidst all the rejoicing, Hazam himself quietly slipped away. And when the kings and queens noted, <coughs> I've been sick a little bit lately. <coughs> and he comes back every now and then. <coughs> One day we will see him. And another, you won't. He doesn't like being tied down. And of course, he has other countries to attend to. It's quite all right. He's often dropped in. Only you mustn't press him. He's wild. You know, not like a tame lion. And now, as you see, this story is nearly, but not quite at an end. These two kings and two queens governed Narnia well and long and happy were their reigns. At first, much of their time was spent in seeking out the remnants of the White Witch's army and destroying them. And indeed, for a long time, <coughs> there was news of evil things lurking into the wild parts of the forest haunting here and lurking there, wild parts of the forest. And a killing there, and a glimpse of werewolves, one's mouth, and a rumor of a hag. But in the end, all the foul brood was stamped out. And they made good laws, and kept the peace, and saved the good trees from being unnecessarily cut down. A liberated young dwarfs and young stays from being sent to school and generally stopped busybodies and interferers and encouraging ordinary people who wanted to live and let live. And they drove back to the fierce giant, quite a different sort of giant, on the north of Narnia where they ventured across the frontier and they entered into friendship and alliance with countries beyond the sea and paid visits to states and received visits from states from then. And they themselves grew and changed as the years passed over them. And Peter became tall and deep chested man and a great warrior. He was called King Peter the Magnificent. And Susan grew into a tall, gracious woman with black hair that fell almost to her feet. And the king of the countries beyond the sea began to send ambassadors asking for her hand in marriage. And she was called Queen Susan the Gentle. Edmund was a graver and quieter man than Peter, and a great in counsel and judgment. He was called King Edmund the Just. But as for Lucy, she was always gay and golden-haired, and all princesses in those parts desired her to be their queen, and her own people called her Queen Lucy the Valiant. So they lived in great joy. And if ever they remembered their life in this world, it was only as one remembered a dream. And one year it fell out that Tumus, who was middle aged fawn by now, and beginning to be stout, came down the river and brought the news that the white stag had once more appeared in his parts. The white stag who would give you wishes if you caught him. So the two kings and the two queens with the principal members of their court 
rode a hunting, and horns and hounds and western woods to follow the white stag. And they had not hunted long before they had the sight of him. And he led them to a great place over rough and smooth and through thick and thin till the horses of all the carriers were tied cut and only the four were still following. And they saw the stag enter the thicker and the horses could not follow. Then said King Peter, for they talked a quite different style now, having been king and queens for a long time. Fair concierge, tell us all right from your horses and follow this beast into the thicket. For in all my days, I never hunted a nobler quarry. Sir, said the others, even so, let us do. So they all alighted and tried their horses through the trees and went into the woods on foot. As soon as they had entered into it, entered it Queen Susan said, Fair friends, here is a great marvel, for I seem to see a tree of iron. Madam, said King Adam, if you look well upon it, you shall see it is a pillar of iron of lanterns sent on the top thereof. Marry a strange device, said King Peter, to set a lantern here where the trees cluster too thick about it and so high above it it were too lit should give light to no man sir said queen lucy but likelihood this post and this lamp were set here there were smaller trees in place or fewer or none for this is a young wood, and the iron post is old. And they stood looking upon it. Then said King Edmund, I know not what it is, but this lamp on the post worketh upon me strangely. It runs in my mind that I have seen the likes of it before, as if in a dream, or in the dreams of dreams. Sir, answered them all, it is even so with us also, and more, said Queen Lucy, for it will not go out of my mind that it was past this post of lanterns, either we shall finally find a strange adventures or else some great charge of our fortunes. Madame, said King Edmund, the like foreboring stretches in thine heart. And in mine also, fair brother, said King Peter, and in mine too, said the Queen Susan, Wherefore, by my counsel, we shall lightly return to our horses and follow this white stag no further. Madame, said King Peter, wherein I pray thee to have me excused, for never since we four were kings and queens of Narnia. We had set our hands to any high matter of battles, quests, feats of arms, acts of justice, and the like, and given over, but always what we have taken in hand, the same we have achieved. Sister, said Queen Lucy, my royal brother speaks rightly, 
and it seems to me we should be ashamed if any feared or foreboden we turn back from following the noble a beast and now we have in chase and so i said king edwin and i have much desire to find the significance of this thing and i would not by my good will turn back for the richest jewel of all of Narnia and all of the islands. Then, in the name of Aslan, said Queen Susan, If ye will, all have it so, let us go now and take the adventure that has fallen upon us. So these kings and queens entered the thicket, and before they had gone a score paces, they all remembered that the thing they had seen was called a lamppost. And before they had gone twenty more, they noticed that they were making their way not through branches but through coats. And the next moment, they all trembled out of a wardrobe door into an empty room. And they were no longer kings or queens in their hunting array, but just Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy in their old clothes. It was the same day the same hour of the day on which they had gone into the wardrobe to hide. And Mrs. McReady and the visitors were still talking in the passageway, but luckily they never came into that empty room so the children weren't caught. Because you remember Mrs. McReady did not like the children to be around, and that would have been a very, very end of the story if it hadn't been that they felt they really must explain to the professor why four of the coats out of the wardrobe were missing. And the professor, who was very remarkable man, didn't tell them not to be silly or not to tell lies, but to believe the whole story. No, he said, I don't think it will be any good trying to go back through the wardrobe door to get those coats. You won't get into Narnia again by that route, nor will the coats be much use to you now, eh, would they? Yes, of course, you'll get back to Narnia again some day. But... Don't go trying to use the same route twice. Indeed, don't try to get them there at all. It'll happen when you're not looking for it. And don't talk too much about it, even amongst yourselves. And don't mention it to anyone else unless you find that they've had adventures of the same sort themselves. What's that? How will you know? Oh, you'll know all right. Odd things, they'll say. Even their looks will let you, will let the secret out. Keep your eyes open. Bless me, what do you, they teach them in those schools? And that was the very end of the adventures of the wardrobe. But it was the professor, but if the professor was right, it was the only beginning adventure of Narnia. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the story. I hope you all.
fun for the story. And I was just fooled the best. Thank you.